life is not about perfection, it's about authenticity. Welcome to the When We Are Brave podcast, a podcast sharing inspirational stories and conversations, plus tips and tricks on living your best and bravest life. I'm your host, Tiffany Johnson, author of Brave Enough Now, keynote speaker and your host of the When We Are Brave podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to When We Are Brave. I know that together we are going to live our best and bravest life. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our guest today, Sarah Turner. Sarah is a Royal Australian Navy veteran. She joined the Navy at the age of 17. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and Politics and is a Classified International Category A Hydrographic Surveyor. Sarah served during the Gulf War and at the age of 23, she was one of the youngest ever qualified female navigators. But not only is Sarah a military officer, She is also a yoga teacher and a mindfulness instructor, plus a best-selling author and a solopreneur. She specialises in female mindfulness and is an authenticity coach. She's a hater of toxic positivity and she's incredibly passionate about changing and empowering women in mental health so that other women never have to find their space below rock bottom. Sarah created her company, Dojo Life, and she was from humble beginnings teaching local women in her community when her company grew to over 50,000 women globally. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce you to Sarah. I learned so much from my conversation with Sarah, and I really hope that you get to take away a lot of value in today's episode of When We Are Brave. It is filled with tips and tricks on living your best and bravest life. Good morning, Sarah, and welcome to the When We Are Brave podcast. It is my absolute pleasure to have you on our show today. Oh, thank you, Tiffany. It's lovely to be here. Excellent. So for our beautiful listeners out there, I would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself, about who you are, and how you got to be where you are today. Yeah, so I guess my story is... uh, quite a traditional I think Australian military story if you talk to a lot of military families my father was a Vietnam veteran uh, an undercover police detective undercover drug squad and my grandfather was a World War II veteran so I was born in Adelaide South Australia into a very regimented and what I now realize is a pattern of self-sacrifice family Um, so I grew up with all these images of what and ideas of what it meant to be brave and strong. So as a very young child, I was always exposed to a lot of heroic stories and what self-sacrifice really meant. So I guess by the time I was probably 10, we'd lived in two or three hotels. My parents, my father, when he stopped uh, working for the police force, they actually bought hotels. So I guess the other really strong point in my childhood it was it was always exposed to a lot of alcohol and especially a lot of high functioning people that used alcohol as a release. So I sort of had this dichotomy of self sacrifice, but it was always, I guess, mediated by drinking too much. That was your release. So they were some of my very early subliminal messages that I grew up with. And I mean I looking back now it's quite interesting. I guess I was very blessed to have a father and a mother that were probably the antithesis of snowplow or helicopter parents. Like I was just literally quite wild and free and I I grew up very empowered that way. But obviously with that, I had some experience as a young child where I was put in a situation uh, with a friend. Um, I went away camping with her father. And, you know, you have those gut instincts. And I knew at the time that you know this was this was wrong. He 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 just he he ramped my radar up. But again, if you look back at my modelling, which was self-sacrificing and this history of veterans and putting other people before yourself, I thought she was quite bullied at school. So I thought you know well this is my opportunity to be brave and be self-sacrificing. So against my better judgment, I actually went away with her. And I don't talk about a lot what happened. 
uh, over that night, but obviously my gut instinct was right. It was a situation I should never have been in. But again, coming back to my parents, it's interesting again this subconscious subconscious condition subconscious sorry conditioning. I never spoke to them about it because I thought that was my burden to bear because my modelling of adults, you know, was always you you self sacrifice you bear this burden. So then, pretty normal. Um, the rest of my childhood, you know, went through schooling. Then when I graduated, it was sort of like, I guess it was almost foretold that I would join the military. That's all I'd sort of ever known. So I joined the military actually at 16 and I just turned 17 when I was um, sent to the Australian Defence Force Academy in Canberra, which again, uh, another huge eye-opening experience. You know, that really was, I guess, a lot of the elite high school graduates around Australia, like everyone was an overachiever, you know, everyone was a star track athlete, everyone was a great long distance runner, everyone was a straight A student. It was just this hyper overachieving sort of atmosphere, if I can put it like that. Um, I graduated the academy in 1999, um, started my naval career then. Yeah, I, I guess I always felt a little bit like a fish out of water because I don't think authentically that um, necessarily was who I was at my heart, but that was sort of the model I'd grown up with, so naturally what I did. Yeah, then went on to get my warfare ticket, uh, went on to become a navigator, served in the Gulf War, uh, went on to become an international category A hydrographic surveyor, that's a, a, quite a great nerd. So, we, you know, you make charts of the road, maps that you follow on Google. We actually make three-dimensional charts of the ocean. So Captain Cook, obviously the world's most famous hydrographic surveyor, they obviously did it in the old days with a lead line. We did it GPS and echo sounders and, yeah, basically we go around the world making charts for fishermen, for mariners, yeah, to safely navigate at sea. Wow. That's such an unusual profession. <laughs> it is. And I think I sort of was led to that because I'm quite scientific by heart. And after the Gulf War and experiences I'd had, I I sort of wasn't brave enough to leave the military. I didn't know who I was outside of the military, but uh, this was sort of a nice segue for me to be probably a little less uh, in the thick of the warfare side of the Navy. So I really enjoyed the scientific, the study, uh, with a lot of exploration, like up in Papua New Guinea and all through the Coral Sea, you know, places people just never get to go. So I absolutely loved that. And it was really quite a saviour for me at the time, I think, yeah. Your time uh, in the Navy came to an abrupt end when you hit 30. Yeah, so, uh, you know, and I talk a lot about this, I think it's, it's actually not a recognised medical condition. I, I think it perhaps soon will be, but so many women in particular I deal with suffer from this high-functioning anxiety. Um, and I guess, you know, growing up we have anxiety to a certain extent, but what happens is when, you know, we become into this uber-competitive um, high-stress work environment, which obviously the military is, we're sort of taught that busyness is our greatest asset, you know, fatigue and busyness, you push them to the side, you keep pushing through, you know, it's almost a badge of honour. And the unfortunate side effect of that is if you never actually deal with what's going on under the line and you never learn to self-care or take time for yourself or have any form of mindfulness, like anything, eventually you're going to burn out. So what happened to me is I been battling this incredible self-negativity, this imposter syndrome, which is another uh, quite common aspect of high-functioning anxiety. Again, my childhood modelling, I was dealing with this through alcohol, so I would go on big binge sessions at the end of a hard week or a hard deployment. Again, that was very acceptable in the military. We all did that. That's how we bonded. So eventually, yeah, come 30, one day I was due to deploy. I think we are going to Papua New Guinea. And I literally, Tiffany, I tried to open the front door and I couldn't breathe. I was shaking, hyperventilating. And I I literally remember thinking this cannot happen to me. 
like I, I've been to war or I'm a badass. I'm all of these things I'd been telling myself, but it didn't matter. Literally every time I tried to open the door, I couldn't breathe and I felt like I was suffocating. I was crushing. And, yeah, it was really lucky for me. I went to the doctor on the base and I said, look, this weirdest thing happened. This is ridiculous. You know, give me something, fix this up. And he looked at me and he said, oh, look, I think you're not well. And this poor man, I remember I ranted and raved at him, you don't know what you're talking about. Just give me something, fix me up. I need to get on with this. And he said, look, I'm actually going to stop you from sailing. And I'm my whole world collapsed, Tiffany, and I remember thinking, if I don't have this, what do I have? And as soon as he stopped me sailing, I mean, God bless this man now, he saved my life. But as soon as he stopped me sailing, it was just a rapid fall. I literally completely shattered apart. Every mask that I thought I'd successfully maintained slipped off. And I, yeah, I, I found there's quite a lot of space actually under rock bottom. And I found that pretty quickly. Uh, Navy wasn't really great with mental health at this stage. I was sort of sent home and sent to the psychiatrist, but it just all unraveled. And I think within probably six months, I was medically discharged, PTSD, anxiety, depression, and alcohol abuse. And one of the saddest things about the military at that time was it was literally, okay, thanks for coming. See you later. You know, so literally one day you're this lieutenant commander, high functioning, doing amazing things. And the next day I was unemployed, medically discharged and yeah, in a really low space, which obviously is now the place from which I launched the new me. But at the time, yeah, that was an incredibly lonely, sad, depressing place. Yeah. Mm, and the carpet has been completely pulled out from under your feet. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, one of the things you really quickly realise is that, you know, we create this persona and I think we trick ourselves into believing who we are to a certain extent. And, you know, when, when you really, really lose yourself, that's the moment when you actually find yourself because you realise that it is all an illusion, is it is all a mask we present to the world. And when you're forced to rip that off, yeah, there's really nowhere else but to face that darkness. Otherwise, we know the Absolutely. other way goes, yeah. And when there's darkness, there's always light as well. Yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing, you know, it, it took me – a really long time so the greatest burden I carried is when I was about 21 and I was first deployed to the goal we used to do a thing called boarding parties so vessels coming out of Kuwait would be smuggling contraband and, and there was an international coalition of forces that would go and apprehend these vessels and then we would sail them to a holding ground for processing so I was in charge of um, one of the parties that would go and sail the ship I navigated the ship to the holding ground one particular night it was about 2 a.m and the Americans had taken down one of these vessels smuggling contraband because we had a detachment of American marines and if you know Americans they're quite aggressive um military wise so you know they'd really they'd roughed up the crew a bit the, the ship was fairly destroyed you know they'd some things had gone on and, you know, you walk on again and that sinking feeling of, oh, wow, okay, it's pitch black in the Persian Gulf. Um, I have to sail this vessel. And in those days, you know, it was only a handheld GPS and a paper chart. And I thought, no, I've got this. And, I'm, you know, looking back, I did a great job. I sailed the vessel with the crew to the holding ground. But, you know, about three quarters of the way through, um, I was unaware that the captain, obviously, of the vessel, he still had to drive it for me. I didn't know how to drive his ship, so I was giving him directions of where to sail. He was obviously quite savvy and he knew that there was a chartered danger um, between our routes. So unbeknownst to me, he was silently, you know, slipping us towards this chartered danger. So I'm plotting away thinking, oh, I'm not doing a bad job. <laughs> and I plot this fix and we're basically on top of this chartered danger. And I just stopped and I thought, oh, my God, this is it, you know, I've it's going to explode I've killed everyone and I just sort of held my breath and I looked at him and he looked at me and by some miracle we missed whatever the charter danger was and we kept sailing and it's so interesting because I came back and you know I got a bit of a reaming that you should have paid more attention you should have you know there's so many what ifs when you're out there you, you know you got to imagine it's pitch black you've got all these things going on and, you know you're trying to rationalize where you're going what you're doing prioritize different things 
And I got back and, you know, had the navigator at the time said to me, oh, Sarah, you should have been more aware of this, but, you know, no worries, it went okay. And sort of had all the other officers around saying, look, here's where Sarah went wrong, don't make this mistake. And that was sort of it. And I sort of thought, "Mm, okay. But the thing I never realised is I, as with this high-functioning anxiety and this need to always be perfect, saw this as a complete monumental failure. And no matter how far I kept going in life, I, I just carried this giant noose that I was a fraud, that one day everyone would discover that I truly was a fraud, you know, and I couldn't let it go for a long, long time. Um, and I guess that was really the pivotal moment that started me falling apart um, and I never dealt with that. And I think looking back, perhaps if I'd had someone there that I could have spoke with or worked through this process that could have said, hey, mate, you're 21, nothing happened, you did a great job. But, again, we didn't really have those tools in place and I was a master at this stage by covering my emotions. So that's what I did. And eventually, you know, there's only so much alcohol you can drink (laughs) to get to sleep before, you know, the body burns out. And that's, yeah, my story. Wow, that's amazing. I think so many people can totally relate in a way that not everybody's been a naval officer but that they feel some part of their life that they have that imposter syndrome it's such a huge part of our society these days people just feel like a, they don't belong and yet they have to belong within themselves and believe in themselves yeah and it, you know it's such it's something and I work so hard with the ladies I work with now and especially with my children too and I really teach them that don't believe everything you think and it it's interesting, one of the easiest tools I ever first learnt is I taught myself and I call my head voice the Prince of Lies <laughs> and a lot of other people, I encourage other women if you're out there and men too, it works for you, but I encourage them, name that head voice because I think, like I always say, when you name it, you shame it a little bit. It takes away that power. So, you know, that voice still comes up for me all the time, but I'm so much better today at saying, ah, I hear you, Prince of Lies, not today things to do not today you know so I'm I'm really good at at making almost a joke of that imposter thought so I'm like oh here he is again haha <laughs> good to see you of course you're here I'm about to do a podcast with Tiffany of course you want to reflect <laughs> on everything I've done wrong in the last five years so that leads us into a great question which is what does it mean to you to live your best and bravest life when you've been incredibly brave in your life what you've done the fact that you went and served for our country is amazing yeah living your best and bravest life you know for me I think it's the realization there's a I mean there's a few realizations for me my best and bravest life to me is authenticity so there is no power in me presenting a facade of perfection to you like there's no power in me saying oh Tiffany my thoughts are so great now you know I meditated 20 minutes before our podcast and after this I'm going to yoga for an hour and then you know I'll pick up my perfect family and we'll have perfect sashimi that I've hand rolled you know oh you're doing so well I know. <laughs> just I mean the, we know the truth Tiffany we couldn't get you know we couldn't get the computers to work and my my daughter wouldn't go to sleep and the dog next door was the dog next door was barking you know and I think this is the point like life is not about perfection it's about authenticity and when you truly live in that authenticity and you're not ashamed to say you know I screamed at my kids this morning because I've lost my noodle but I apologize to them and pointed out I'm not perfect and here's what I'm going to do different like that to me is living a brave life yeah absolutely I'm so you know, I'm a hater of toxic positivity and I see so much in my market, you know, about you, know, you have this great breakthrough on the yoga mat. You know, that's not where your breakthroughs happen. Your bravest and best life happen when your kids are screaming in the grocery line and you're fighting with your husband and you manage to stay calm, you know, and and, and connect and still be compassionate to what other people are going through you know that to me your authenticity that's living your bravest life it's not an absence of fear it's being brave enough to say I'm really scared but I'm going to give it my best shot yeah I agree and those moments help us grow and learn and evolve as humans and we're all better for it too and I think the other thing with your bravest life is that 
calm is your superpower. Like if you can find that anchor to your breath, you know, so many things are said in a rush of anger or frustration or, you know, this is where I think my life should be, this is the plan it should be going to. You know, that's really the case. And I think living your bravest life is recognising that authenticity and remaining calm throughout those moments where it is easy to lash out. So being calm for you helps you to overcome your fear? Yeah, because, look, I don't think it's about the absence of fear. Like everyone has fear and fear is an incredibly powerful motivator. Fear gets us out of our comfort zone. Fear drives us to do great things and, and gives us that sense of worth and accomplishment. It's not it's not about the absence of fear you know I think fear is such an integral part of us it's it's about being authentic with our fear you know so if we're with other women I'm really nervous about doing this yeah me too okay great let's anchor each other let's talk about this let's be authentic yeah I, I, I I worry about this you know I hear lots of live fearlessly or do this fearlessly I I don't think it's about the absence of fear. I think it's about embracing that fear. You know, a bit like Maya Angelou always said, even with my voice shaking, I'm standing here talking to you. That authenticity, yeah, that's a powerful driver for me. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that phrase that you've just said too, to really anchor each other. What a beautiful way to connect with other people and to support each other. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things, obviously, as a scientist, I learned very early on because I was trying so desperately to heal. You know, again, I thought healing was this thing, this process you did over six weeks and then you were good. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm really smart. I'll heal now. You know, I'm reading all these things. But one of the things that really resonated with me early and I learned through my PTSD and, you know, as my awareness grew around the body's fight or flight function, and I realised that the truly successful people in the midst of this fear and this fight or flight were able to anchor themselves back to something. So for me, it was always breath because I knew when I was in flight mode, I was flooding my body with cortisol. And when I'm flooding my body with cortisol, none of my higher thinking is turned on. I'm literally in how do I get out of this situation? But I learned through my studies and research that if I actually could anchor myself to my breath, I would flood my brain with oxytocin, obviously the love drug, which is our higher reasoning. So I could almost say, look, I'm fearful, but my higher reasoning is telling me here's here's some choices I can make as opposed to the knee-jerk cortisol reaction. So anchoring to me is so important. And I teach my children every day, you know, fine. I think we were talking about yesterday, weren't we, having a laugh, Tiffany, about my daughter who anchors to a cat. Yes, I love that. So her anchor is, you know, when she gets scared, she channels a cat, which again calms her. So it's finding that whatever that is for you that anchors you, whether it's the touch or I have ladies I work with that it's, you know, the smell of their grandmother's perfume reminds them that they're loved. So they'll take a little, you know, flannel with their grandma's perfume and if they're overwhelmed, they'll have a sniff. And I think that is just magic. Yeah. The grandmother's love can be pretty powerful stuff. Well, we're the love of thousands. I think we forget this. You know, we're the love of thousands of people that have come before us, that have loved us before they've even known us. So when you can connect to that love, it's so empowering. Yeah, absolutely. I have very fond memories of my grandmother's both of my grandmothers their love for me my great grandmother who I was fortunate enough to know she died I think when I was maybe three but I do have no I think I was older but anyway um she was 94 when she died and I have beautiful memories of her smile and so you're right it is those moments isn't it when we really can connect with those people who love us because at the end of the day there is someone sometimes we feel that we're all alone and there's no one out there that cares for us but there will always be someone there is someone yes. out there that always yeah. cares for you and that's the greatest trick I think mental health particularly plays on us it isolates us and it tricks us into thinking we're alone and I remember when I first was breaking down I pushed everyone away because I, I thought no one's been through this no one understands you know no one could mm. feel like this like this is So your natural instinct is to isolate. And, again, if you can find that anchor that can reconnect you with people, I think that's such a powerful tool. And especially, obviously, you hear all the time about the modern world and technology and our disconnection. It's probably even more important, you know, because we don't have those neighbours coming to check on us or 
you know, that we used to have even 30 years ago. So, yeah, that mm-hmm. anchor and that connection, especially when you feel so low, I think that's when true bravery comes to the forefront, when you can say, hey, I'm not doing okay today. Could we meet for a coffee? And the importance of things like are you okay day, so not only just being the person that is being brave in saying, no, I'm having a bit of a hard time, but also being brave in approaching someone and saying, I've noticed that maybe you're not doing okay. That's amazing. Yeah, my kids get so embarrassed. We'll randomly at the shop, they'll see someone a bit upset and I'll touch their shoulder, are you okay? (laughs) My kid's like, mum, you don't even know them, back away. (laughs) But it might just be the thing that lights up their day and the oh, darkness exactly. that we talked about before, you've brought that light. Exactly. So we've talked so much about tools and tips on being brave and living your best and bravest life. And I know that through your journey and you've been able to find this amazing calling, your purpose in life, is your Daijo life yeah. business that you're running to help other people. And I know that in that there's lots of tips and tricks and journals. Everyone out there will know that I'm a massive fan of journaling. It's been one of the biggest tools I've used through my own PTSD in recovery. And um, I would really love to know more about um, Daijo life and let our listeners hear a little bit more about that. And also if you've got any other um, tips up your sleeve that you'd like to share on being brave. Yeah, well, I mean, first off, your journaling, you're spot on. Like you you just, there's no way to authentically fall back in love with your soul, I don't think, until you can recognise the patterns that have formed it. And I think with journaling, you know, there's, there's this aspect of release that comes with physically writing too. It's very powerful. And, it, it, you know, it's your best friend. It's a confidant. But it's also that. You know, there's nowhere to hide. You can't keep yourself as these things are sort of flowing from you. You know, you see that past, you see those cycles so clearly. And I think that's one of the really powerful things with journaling um, in particular. So, yes, I'm right with you, Tiffany. I just had to say that. I think journaling is the single greatest healing tool I've ever used, whether, you know, it's just brain dumping even your day to get it out of your head. I When I first started, I used to brain dump my day and leave it in the letterbox. So that I didn't bring it into the house. I redirected my mail so that bills didn't come to the house. You know, all of these little things that were triggers for me, journaling mm. allowed me to see them and then I removed them as best I could. So, yeah, journaling's huge. But I guess getting to Dijo life, it, it's been so interesting for me because obviously as a military background and then a hydrographic surveyor, I'm as far from, you know, what you would call a spiritual teacher as you could probably get. Um, and I, when I first started, you know, I was very quickly drawn to yoga. I quick, really, all the Eastern, you know, mythologies really just resonated with me. So I started my own yoga practice. I just got my own accreditation for myself and built my own little yoga studio on the block we were living. And then local women I'd talk with, I'd say, you know, come down and do some yoga with me, you know, and I'd really concentrating on releasing things that were stored emotionally throughout the body. And it sort of grew and, you know, I'd have little mentoring sessions and the ladies that were coming quite regularly said, Sarah, you should write all of this down, you know, in a guided journal. And I wrote it down and and had a little Facebook page for them and it just sort of grew. And before I knew it, you know, there's sort of 50,000 people that are like, oh, I like this idea, Sarah. And I'm like, oh, I don't don't think I'm qualified for this. But I think that's the true beauty of it is, I guess, that authenticity again resonated with a lot of people because I'm not saying life is about perfection. I'm saying life is messy and that's the whole point. It's like, you know, happiness isn't this destination ahead of us. It's it's inside of us and it's realising that even on your dark days there is happiness. So I guess my greatest tip I try and tell people, especially the ladies I sort of work with one-on-one, is you have to create gratitude as an action in your life. There's two main tips I have. My first one is gratitude as an action. So by that I mean smiling makes us happy. So if I'm feeling down and I smile, I become happy. So many women in particular I work with have nothing they feel to be grateful for. So I really bring it back and I'm like, then create something for someone else to be grateful for. So go out and hold the door for someone, say good morning, say I really like your dress, 
you know, create some moments because gratitude is an action. And the more that we create gratitude around us, the more grateful things come to us. So that's my first great tip. And I guess my second one is, and this is probably the hardest and it sounds easy, but it takes, you know, a lot of discipline and work to do is learn to become comfortable in the silence again. Because especially um, with anxiety, PTSD, we tend to create a lot of noise in our world because it distracts us from that delightful prince of lies that's whispering all this negative nonsense in our head. So we become very uncomfortable with the silence because that's, you know, when he talks the loudest. So I really started very basically, and the women I work with, I start very basically, just create one minute throughout your day, you know, seven days a week. Just start at that where you're in complete silence and you're not dwelling on thoughts, but you see them, you recognise them, you let them flow by. And then you work up, obviously, and mindfulness training comes in. But it's really recognising that, you know, there's no way back to that authenticity without learning to be comfortable in the silence. And that's very, very powerful for me because I think we can mm-hmm. kid ourselves with a lot of yoga or guided meditations and things. But, you know, at the end of the day, you're your guru, you understand yourself best. So I think but learning and being disciplined enough to become comfortable in that silence is a really powerful healing tool. That is absolutely fantastic. I've been practising meditation now for, oh, maybe since I was 18. I'm not going to disclose how long that is, people, but it's a long <laughs> time. <laughs> you back to me. Are you and- repeating your 21st birthday? I've done it a couple of times now. <laughs> And um, and it ta- you're right, it really takes a long, long time to be able to sit comfortably in silence. It does. And really let, let everything go. Mm. And when you do get into that state where you are able to do that, it is the most peace yeah. you've ever experienced. It really is. And I don't know, I mean, this is a side topic, but I don't know if you saw the other night there was that bushfire concert appeal in Australia and Katie Lang sang hallelujah and if you ever want to know and I'm just plugging this because I think anyone that's interested in learning to be brave should watch her performance of that she just stood there and sang that song in complete mindfulness she was in a different place altogether and I looked at her and I thought that must feel magic. Like I could feel that she was just in complete connection with everything around her and I thought, I know how that feels and I was almost envious. I was like, oh, that's magic. So if you haven't had a look at that, yeah, I just thought that was just incredible. It was one of the most moving things I've seen lately authentically. I just thought she just doesn't care. She's just who she is and she's singing from a different place. And I thought it was really beautiful, yeah. Yeah, it's such a gift. Oh, yeah. And that's that that practice of mindfulness. You know, I, it gets so many buzzwords and I think people get confused that it's about stopping your thoughts. You know, we can't stop our thoughts. Our thoughts are there's some powerful forces subliminally at work that, you know, channel them, that shape them. I think it's... It's not attaching the emotion to them. So, you know, I'll still have dreams sometimes subconsciously and I crash ships and I'll wake up shaking and I have to say, no, 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 it's a, it's a thought, Sarah. It doesn't have to have an emotion that you don't have to attach the shame. You can just acknowledge that thought and go, okay, and let it go. Whereas, you know, years ago when I was first starting, I would carry that shame all day, that embarrassment, that imposter syndrome because I attached all of these emotions to the thought. So, yeah, I think mindfulness is a bit misconstrued. It's having the thought but, you know, not attaching all the baggage that comes with it, unhitching that trailer that we love to carry around. Sarah, tell us, where can we learn more about you? How can we connect with you? Yeah, so I I do on my Dijo Life on Facebook, so Dijo, D-I-J-O, Life, and that's the acronym of my two first children, Dixie and Geordie. (laughs) So you can... Any time on DJ Life, you can connect with me and send me a message. I'm probably one of these entrepreneurs, as they say, that hasn't set great boundaries. Like people message me all the time, and I'm a bleeding heart. I'll always message back. 
I'm not. <laughs> yeah, but I'd love that. And and if anyone's ever interested in working with me, I'm also at sarahturner.org. So S-A-R-A-H turner.org. But, yeah, I'll usually post up digolife.com, any events I'm doing coming up. And, you know, my daughter's just turning 18 months. So I'm probably looking at getting back out and doing some more speaking engagements and things like that. But I'm really a, at the moment, I'm just loving this process of having another little baby again. And, you know, she's just so full of joy and life and she reminds me of everything that's so gorgeous to be grateful for. So, yeah, I've been a bit slack lately. I've been a bit sidetracked with my baby. No, not slack. you have got your priorities right. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying to myself too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Unapologetically. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Enjoy all those precious moments, the tantrums, the throwing food, the cuddles, the kisses. Oh, I love it. But, yeah, I mean, definitely, Tiffany, if anyone's out there and they, you know, Dido life's very different. I, I don't, you know, I don't tailor these group coaching programs. I, you know, it's very much an individual journey based on, because everyone's subconscious is different. You know, things that have shaped you, Tiffany, the cycles you repeat are different to the cycles that I repeat. So there is no one size fits all. It's really working with someone individually so that they can understand the cycles, the patterns in their life and then empowering them when these cycles do come up, you know, perhaps take a different approach, a more mindful approach, a calmer approach, you know, and and really empower them to live their best life. That's what I try and do. So it's sort of a cross between coaching and mentoring, I guess. I don't really know how to define it actually. But, yeah. That sounds perfect. Oh, thank you, Dal. (laughs) Well, thank you, Sarah, for sharing your amazing story and how you have overcome extreme adversity, mental health issues, changed careers, have had children, one of our biggest challenges in life. Oh, I meant to that. So just thank you for taking the time out of your busy day and to have a chat with um, me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I have loved learning more and hearing more about your incredible story. So thanks for being on the When We Are Brave podcast. Oh, thank you, Tiffany. And thank you for being brave enough to create such a beautifully authentic space to share these stories and to empower other people to realise, you know, that they're worthy of their own self-care. They really are. They Just before we go, one of the things I most always want to get across to people is that you are no less worthy than anyone else, whether it's a Swiss canyoning disaster, whether it's war experience, whether you were bullied as a child, you know, whether you had absentee parents, there is no, we, I talk about this all the time, there's no hierarchy of trauma. No one is more worthy of their pain than anyone else. We are all worthy of recognising we have pain and implementing self-care to heal ourselves. And I think what you're doing is lovely in showing all of these stories. So thank you, Tiffany. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I really appreciate it. Well, hopefully all our listeners out there have got a lot out of today. I know I certainly have. So until next time, stay tuned. All the best. Bye for now. There were so many great tips and tricks on living your best and bravest life with my conversation with Sarah. I hope you got as much out of it as I did. If you enjoyed this episode or the other episodes of the When We Are Brave podcast, make sure you subscribe and leave a review. Reviews are what helps us podcast hosts to get noticed. Make sure you share with your friends and family so that they too may get lots of tips and tricks on living their best and bravest life. You can find out more about me on my website, tiffanyjohnson.com.au. You can also get my book, Brave Enough Now, an inspirational story of self-discovery, survival and hope. It's available now on Amazon. It's also coming out as an audio book soon. Yay, I'm so excited. And don't forget to download your free mini guided journal that I have on my website, tiffanyjohnson.com.au it might just be the tool you need to help you live your best and bravest life i also love sharing my story with audiences across the globe as a keynote speaker i share my story of survival and my tools that i've used and tips on resilience and how you can live your best and bravest life You can connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn or send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Head over to my website, tiffanyjohnson.com.au. 
So my friends, be brave until next time and live your best and bravest life.